So uh, the road to Ember Data 1.0, interesting name for a topic. So Ember Data 1.0 has been coming for a long, long time. Currently, it's in a beta 0.0.9 .0 or something like that. We are expecting it to launch sometime soon. So the reason why I want to pick up a topic like this is because I feel Ember Data has quite a value proposition for applications that we build generally. And it can really help us achieve a lot without writing a lot of code. So before I get started, how many of, uh, how many of us are Rails developers? OK. And uh, how many of you have used Ember? Wow, amazing. So uh, the good thing about Ember as such is that uh, the creators of Ember are also regular committers for Ruby on Rails. So uh, the convention or the structure that you see for Ember is very, very similar to that of Ruby. So let me get started. So what is the agenda for today's talk? The agenda is very simple, that we are trying to build an IMDB-like application. Right? So you have a list of movies. We'll just you know, load all the movies. You can see the actors for the movies, etc., etc. So if I look at this particular data, I can like, just click on a particular movie. And I can see the details for the movie. I can click on the actors. I can see what the details for the actor and everything like that. The way I'm going to go about this particular talk is that uh, we'll start building this application using jQuery first. Right? We'll not get into you know, all the hype about Ember and uh, everything like that. So we, let, let's start with jQuery and see what the app looks like if we try and make it on jQuery. So obviously, I'm, I don't want to code right now, so I've already uh, created the branch. So if we were going to make it on jQuery, how would we do it? Just the core ideology. And anyone? Ajax calls. Yes, and then DOM manipulation from your code. So that is exactly what I did as well. So let me just open that one up. So this is the kind of uh, code that I had written. This is my index HTML. It's a very basic HTML. It has uh, the home page. So let's look at the JavaScript part of this particular thing. Right, so just for the sake of uh, simplicity and readability, I have created an object for movie, a class-like structure. So it has an ID, title, summary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then I have a function which can basically load all the movies, which is an AJAX call. So it's not the conventional AJAX dollar dot AJAX because I have wrapped it up inside an AJAX object of my own. Uh, you have a load movie, and you have a long list of translators then, which will just take whatever you get from the response and map it to your object. For ex so you really don't know what is your service going to return to you, right? So it may be returning underscored values. It may be returning camel cased values. It may be returning you values in a snake case. But you really don't want to be writing code to manage all of that multiple times. So what I have done is I have like, you know, brought in the concept of a translator, which will just translate these things for you. And then I have the logic for displaying all of the movies. So I iterate on all of the lists. I start writing a lot of uh, HTML inside. So what is the problem that this thing creates for us? That I, as a JavaScript developer, now have to be aware of uh, how exactly should I write my HTML? What are the classes should I use? So now I am very, very tightly bound to the HTML. right? At the same point of time, I'm also very, very tightly coupled to the services. And not only that, I have ended up a massive JavaScript file. right? So that is one problem that we probably 
that is one problem that we definitely see with writing things with jQuery. That you write, end up writing too much code. You are literally doing everything by hand. So that is the reason why frameworks were invented in the first place. So that you can actually go ahead and leverage the work that somebody else has done for your own benefit. So let's try and introduce Ember. So what I did next was that I ported the JavaScript jQuery application onto pure Ember JS, right? So before I go into the code, I'll just talk a little bit about Ember JS. So the Ember JS is built very, very uh, closely on the concepts of routes, right? What do I mean by routes? Uh, by routes, I mean that uh, to identify a particular state of a particular application, you have to look at the URL. It means that I can pick up this URL and I can give it to any one of you. And when you open it in your browser, you'll see the exact same state that I am seeing. Right? So what do we, despite the fact that it being a single page application, the URL has to maintain the state. Apart from that, Ember is a model view controller like structure. Ember, again, is built on top of uh, on a very object-oriented fashion. So you have concepts of classes, you have concepts of objects, plus you have concepts of things like computed and observable properties. So does anyone know what computed properties are? Seriously, we, uh, I thought we do Angular and stuff. No? Does Angular not have computed properties? OK, so Ember does. Plus one for Ember. So that's binding. So what do I mean by computer properties is, let's say, for example, uh, what's your name? Swapnil Krishna. Krishna. So Swapnil Krishna. So let's say that the service says, uh, gives me two fields, first name and last name, Swapnil and Krishna. But on the, f on, the, uh, on the view side, what I want to display is Mr. Swapnil space Krishna. Right? How would you normally do it? You just probably just go ahead and say Mr. Space, first name, space, last name, which is kind of crappy, right? Why can't you just have something called as field name, which listens to first name and last name and updates its value accordingly? So that's a computer property. The advantage of using something like this is say you have something like price. So I can attach some, a rupee symbol or a dollar symbol based on localization. And it will still change whenever the price value changes. So that's a computer property, right? So I'm pretty sure Angular has it, but plus one for Ember anyways. Whoops. And yes, so we look at the HTML file for Ember. Now Ember uses something called as handlebars to do the templating bit. So what we do is we start with, how many of you worked on ASP.NET? Brilliant. Two, three. Spring? Uh, much more. So you have something like a master page here, right? So the master page displays a particular syntax. So this is going to be the layout of your particular page. You're going to have a navigation bar. I've used Bootstrap for this. And then this particular outlet here is where your content will be rendered, right? Handlebars is a very lightweight templating framework. Things like mustache and uh, J template are also built on top of, if not using completely, handlebars. And then I go ahead and define every possible route that I can have. So I say I have an index route, which is, which will be displayed when I am at the root location, which I have pretty much just taken from the HTML jQuery. So right now, this entire HTML can be essentially developed by the UI guy, and I have no interference with him whatsoever. So he'll, he'll create it using whatever his logic being. And all I'll do is, when, when I get it on my side, I'll just start writing these uh, handlebar syntaxes. So I say, a link to syntax will, rep will replace into an anchor tag. Uh, then I can bind attributes, the source for the movie. So I know the, just the handlebars part of it. And I'm just replacing, picking up and replacing parts of the HTML without actually knowing what classes to use, what margin and what padding that I should be worrying about. So the first level of decoupling comes here, right? That I don't really worry about what my HTML guy is going to say, right? And I just put all of my views in one particular place, and that's about it. 
So and let's look at the JavaScript now. So, oh, this is weird. Sorry about that. So over here, what we can see is that I have a very similar model as I had earlier, right? The only difference now is that I'm inheriting from an Ember object instead of just writing the model by itself. So everything now becomes an Ember object. But the first interesting thing is something that we notice right here, right? So you have something called as an Ember person and uh, Ember actor and Ember director, uh, sorry, app actor and app director are now inheriting from person. So considering an actor is a person and a director is also a person, this is the first place that we actually see an example of inheritance, right? And that is a computed property. The full name function returns first name and last name, right? Now what happens is uh, when I look at the routes, I can basically see that I'm doing a $.getJSON. It's prefixed by an ember dollar for a reason. It's because uh, when I do a dollar dot get JSON, it returns a promise to me, and then I can basically just translate, convert everyone into an observable Ember array, which is the Ember dot A, and I bind it to the view. So what binds the view initially is just the promise bit, so nothing is rendered yet. The moment I get the response, I go ahead and bind that response to the view as well. And similarly, I just go ahead and write the logic for you know what are the coming soon movies. What is, the, what is the logic for the trending movies, et cetera, et cetera. But even after doing this, I realized that I still have this translator you know, that is still bugging me. Because now, even at this point of time, I am still tied down to the service layer. I have not yet achieved complete independence. Right? So let's quickly have a look at the example using Ember. And we'll open it. Developer tools. Oh, sorry. So looking at the developer tools, I see that this particular call has been made, the response for which is returning me a massive array of data. So I'm on the home page, and Movies has actually returned me a list of actors and a list of directors for the movie as well. Am I displaying this on the home page? No, I'm not. But the service is still giving me an embedded response, and I'm still taking that payload, and that's heavy for me. So this is just five or 10 movies. Imagine a much bigger list with a much, a much bigger list of actors. This payload size could be bloated up massively, and there is nothing I can do about it. Even right now today, when we write applications with embedded relationships, we always get all of the data, and then probably figure out some way of caching or storing and maintaining and relating all of this cache data that we have got to somehow try and improve the performance, right? Which I feel is still crappy. So let's go ahead and have a look at Ember data. So Ember data basically works on top of Ember. So it leverages everything that Ember does for you and more. 
So obviously you have your services and you have your application, right? So how does a, a standard request work? So the application basically uh, talks to a store and the store basically gives you a record. So what's a store? A store is essentially a list of records, a, a box in which you can store all of your records. Right? So the application says, hey, I want you to give me uh, a movie by the ID or by the name Hunger Games. Right? And then the store says, okay, here you go. This is the movie by the name Hunger Games. And this now goes to the application and the application just does the data binding and displays it. Perfect. It's amazing. Right? But I still have not leveraged the power of Ember Data now. Right? So let's bring in Ember Data. So the moment I start using Ember Data, what happens is, when I go to the store, the store returns a dummy and empty record to the application. There is nothing in the record. It's empty. It just says that the record is still loading, but here you go. This is the record that you can use eventually. Right? What it does in the meantime is, it uses an adapter and a serializer. Right? So why the plane and the envelope is because the envelope, uh, the, the serializer will basically serialize your response. So the job of the serializer is essentially to read the JSON and understand it, transform it into the type of the record, and, and take the record and transform it into something that the service understands. And the adapter basically just does the calling bit. Who to call, where to call, how to go, that is done by the adapter. So now, after step one completes, now Ember Data kicks into action. So Ember Data says, adapter, get me the movie by the name Hunger Games. So the adapter says, got it, I can do that. I understand what URL I need to go to. I understand what is my host name. I can pretty much form a query on my own. Calls the services. The services says, here you go, adapter. Now, the adapter gives all of this data to the serializer. Now the serializer says, okay, I understand how to parse this particular thing. Let me just unwrap it and give it to the record. But now, while unwrapping, it is just updating the record which was already bound to the view. So, you're using the same record with updated data. The data binds and the handlebar renders itself. Right? So, Ember data becomes completely asynchronous from your entire process. It really does not care about waiting for the response. Right? Which sounds pretty cool to me. And now this record is bound back to the application. So, have we, uh, when, I, when I mentioned in the beginning, I said our, our dependencies are primarily two, HTML services. So, how have we resolved any dependency on HTML? Obviously by using handlebars. But have we resolved any dependency on services? So before we get to that, let me just quickly demonstrate the Ember data code. And this is Ember data. So I loaded this response. Now, let us have a look at a very interesting thing that just happened here. So let me just refresh this. Okay, sorry, not this one. So over here, we see that there are, a movie's call has been made, but notice actors and directors are now just numbers. I have not gotten the entire response for the actors or the entire response for the directors, but just the identifications because I am not using actors anymore. Has my model changed? Not at all. Have my services changed? Not at all. Nothing has changed, but Ember Data is not smart enough to just say, this page does not require an actor. I will not load this actor. This page does not require a director. Let me not load that as well. So how does Ember know when to load it? So let me just try and click on a movie. So 
the moment I clicked on a movie, a lot of calls were made. So a particular call was made to a list of directors and a list of actors as well. So this thing, now from the first response what Ember did was, it said that I know this movie has actors A, B and has director C. And it just kept, it, kept this information with itself. Once I, trans, once I went to a page which was now using the actor, Ember Data was smart enough to say, okay, fine, these are the actors that you are going to use. But now, let me just go back to the page and see if I make any extra calls. So now I'm here. Now, nothing else was loaded. Right? You still have the same list of actors and directors because Ember Data has an inbuilt caching that it is implementing. So it knows that once I have loaded actor ID 10, actor ID 10 has not changed. And let me just keep it with myself, right? So this, yeah? Did someone say anything? So let's look at the code for this. So, starting from the top, you see that you basically have the model. So, the ember.object.extend has now just changed to a DS model extend. So, what is the DS? DS is essentially the data store that we spoke about. And when I say create an object of type DS model, and every attribute of the object is now either a string or something like that. So very, very similar to what we had already written, except for the fact now that Ember can actually track the type of model. So for the earlier case, when I was using pure Ember, yes, at this particular point of time, I would always have to translate the release date into a type of date. I would always have to say new date, release date, new date, release date. I would have to keep doing that or create a function or something which does that for me. But in Ember data, I don't do anything like that, right? I just say that release date is a type of date. And that is all. So an Ember data is smart enough to know that if, if you are a type of date, whatever responses I get, I will just bind it in the type of date and I send it along. And when I look at the translator bit of it, they are now gone. There is no need for a translator. Because Ember data manages the translations for you. So I have typically reduced my lines of code massively, right? So looking back on Ember again, we see that the way we were getting the uh, responses was we were doing a $.getJSON and controller.set model translate movie, a massive, massive, massive line of code, right? And looking at this particular thing, say, for example, actor, I say store.find actor, and that is all. So. Have I mentioned a URL anywhere? What service do I want to hit? Uh, what host name, what namespace? I haven't. Because Ember Data works in a similar way as Ember JS used to, convention over configuration. So when I have a route called as actor, Ember knows that I will have, a, when I specify a model called as actor, I need to hit a service which is slash actors. And that is all Ember needs to know. Now, obviously, if you're writing services in a good way, that's very useful. But what if I am not really doing that? So currently in this example, we know that I am accessing the file from the file system, but my server is actually running on localhost. So if I just say slash actors, it will do a file system slash actors, which is wrong. It will not find anything. So how do I just point it to localhost? Either go and make sure that I change every URL at every particular place that I would ideally do with the jQuery object, right? But no, I don't need to do that. So all I need to do is, I just need to specify at one particular place that my REST adapter needs to go to localhost 3000. That is all. So changing it at one singular place, I can now change my URLs in any particular way that I want. I am not dependent upon the URL to be configured in a particular format. 
So if tomorrow you come and say, okay, we have moved our URLs from this particular server and we have moved it to the AWS server, the JavaScript guy just goes and changes one line and that is all. You really need not worry about writing anymore. So we are moving closer and closer towards decoupling ourselves from the services as well. But the biggest problem is that, say you are a developer and somebody comes and says, I want you to start developing this application. What's the first question you're going to ask? Okay, give me the response, give me the service response. Otherwise, how am I going to code my JavaScript, right? So you would ideally need something like a, like a mock that will help you code as close as possible to the services and not be really dependent upon the services. And that's what we, we call fixtures. Right? So using fixtures, we can actually remove the dependency on services. So what are fixtures? Fixtures are exactly what it sounds. It's fixture data. So looking at the very particular example that we were still looking at, we see that this thing has all of the list of movies and everything that we can possibly have. Right? You have your ID, summary, title, actors, directors. All of it is bound together. Right? And Notice that over here I'm just saying actors one and director one. I'm not really writing, I'm not really binding an actor to it because that is all that Ember requires. Since I know that, I can essentially code according to that, right? And what do I do now? Is I just say that my adapter is a fixture adapter. So I will not make any calls to any services and I will just make sure that I am fetching data from the fixtures. It's that simple. But, okay, fine. Now, we come into a situation where now the services are ready. Oops. Right? So, now let's add the services. So, how much effort do you think it is going to take to now, you know, incorporate back the services? Any idea? How? So, now we've been using fixtures till now. We have made sure that we point to a fixture adapter. Over the top of your head, what do you think we should do now to make sure that we are now hitting the services? Change the adapter? Do you think it should be that simple? It could be that simple? <laughs> it's actually simpler than that, to be honest. You just remove this line. You don't even need to remap anything. So by default, the adapter for your application is the REST adapter. So if you don't specify an adapter, it is a REST adapter. So over here, I'm specifying an adapter, hence I'm overriding the default configuration. So by just commenting out this line or deleting this line, that's it. That's all you need to point back to your services. How many think that's cool? Nobody. <laughs> yeah, cool. So. So now let's let's talk about some very simple customizations that can happen. We can you know have uh, how, how would you go about writing a custom host name or how would you go about writing a custom API or how would you handle changes in response? So the way Ember data has been created is is that you, as a starter, getting your app to run on Ember data is very simple. You know your uh, initial setup time is very small, but at the same point of time. They have given you every tool that you would require to build everything that is custom. So just you, if you want to customize a host name, you just reopen the adapter and you write the host name in front of it. If you want to create a, a custom API, so for example, let's say today your apps are running on version one slash whatever URLs, but tomorrow you, cho you change to version two. So what change needs to happen on your app is that you just go reopen the adapter and you just write it again. So how exactly would you do something like that would be so you will say the application adapter so you will just extend the rest adapter and you'll say the namespace is now say v2 and that is it 
And with that particular change, all of your services will now start pointing to slash v2 slash whatever was the URL that they were thinking about. What about, so I just mentioned that when you have a model called as actor, Ember says that I'm going to hit something called as actors. So it is doing a pluralization for you. So let's take an example of city. So Ember is dumb, right? It's going to say city, plural cities, C-I-T-Y-S, which is unacceptable, right? We cannot have a plural of city as cities because that's not how I'll make my uh, services. So Ember gives you something called as an inflector. The inflector allows you to customize your pluralization. So you just say that the plural of city is cities. Now, how about something which is uncountable, like, I don't know, rating. Rating is not ratings. Rating is always rating. So you say, ember, inflector, uncountable, rating. And that is it. So every customization that you are thinking of doing or would want to ideally do in a, in a simplistic scenario is all one line only. Now, let's say that today you are getting a response in, a very, in the format that we just looked at. But tomorrow, we want to really go ahead and have something like side-loaded relationships. So does anyone know what side-loaded relationships are? Can you tell me what side-loaded relationships are? Yes, exactly. So when I get like an embedded relationship, uh, embedded response, like you get the entire actor, so I don't take and give the entire actor to Ember Data directly. What I do is that I strip out the actor bit and I strip out the director bit and just pop in the IDs in the exact same fashion that Ember wants it. And then Ember will load it and display it just the way it wants to. So it really will not go and fetch the actors the second time, like we saw earlier, that it was actually going and saying, get actor 10, get actor 11. If I get an embedded relationship, I can maintain the asynchronousity that Ember gives me along with not actually having to make multiple calls. Another beautiful feature that came out with Ember Data 9 is that just the way we saw that, you know, when you have, say, 10 actors, we, we would make, be making 10 calls, right? Every actor, one call. You can actually specify that I want to club all these calls together. By doing this, you make just one call, and instead of doing a slash actor slash one or two, you do a slash actors question mark ID one or ID two or ID three. So Ember does that bit for you as well. And it just pretty much becomes that simple. So this was the get bit. So you know, just get calls and everything. So how would a create look like? Or an edit look like? So let me just quickly find that. Oh, sorry, missed it. Too small. So I have an edit here. And I say that my edit is done. So when I say edit is done, I just get the current model, and I say save. And that is it. So when I say model.save, a put is sent to the server with the ID that I have saved. And the body is the response, uh, is the changed object. So let's have a look at the example. So I'm going to remove these two lines. And I'm going to open the Ember Data application. So this particular Ember Data that I had loaded earlier was running on fixtures. And you would see that this has made no calls whatsoever to the services. right? The XHR is empty, the one that I had loaded earlier. Now that I have moved it on to the actual services, we wow, I didn't go as expected. Oh.
How do I do a control F5? Thank you. This uh, particular call that I had made should ideally have loaded data, which it doesn't seem to have. I don't know why it's not working. I have no clue why it's not working right now. So no, it's, it's not working with the services. For now, it is still referring to the fixtures. Probably something that I'm missing on this particular thing. Really sorry about that. So yeah, I was talking about customizations. Uh, that's, that's about it that I had in mind. The reason I chose the topic to be something like the road to Ember data is that I actually wanted to walk through the steps of creating an application from, say, jQuery over to Ember.js and then finally to Ember data. And just try and say how easy or how difficult it is to go from jQuery to Ember data and how easy it makes our life as developers. That would be all from my side. Thank you.